Hello, everybody. My name is Carol Carter, and this is a session for World Academy of Art and Science called The Equity Impact at Scale, Collaborations Moving the Needle of Access and Equity. I'm the founder and the CEO of Global Minded, and we're a proud World Academy of Art and Science partner dedicated to creating a diverse talent pipeline to get more women, people of color, and poverty-affected citizens into the education, economic mobility, and leadership pipeline. We do this through monthly equity events, a daily newsletter profiling role models who have overcome the odds, annual inclusive leader awards, and programs which connect our least resource students to role models, mentors, internships, and jobs. COVID has exacerbated these problems. And during the pandemic, billionaires made more money and tech giants had some of their best years ever while essential workers and others on the front lines of healthcare and teaching struggled to just hang on. Many of our least resource students the world over struggled to continue their education while balancing loss of family members, jobs, and housing. Today, we are here to outline equity impact at scale. And we define that as reversing generations of disparities in education, employment, housing, and health, tackling the hidden structures of power and privilege, which prevent talented people from all backgrounds to get gainful employment and realize financial freedom, working with uncommon collaborators, not the usual suspects, making our circles bigger than what we typically um, are able to interact with and moving from talk to action. So what matters and what works gets measured and can multiply. Education is at the heart of equity and a life of gainful advancement. So technology and open resource content holds promise for free and open education for all. Panelists we have selected today will give us a perspective on what needs to change in academics, industry, and with funders, as well as an overview of what the next generation expects and demands from the world of learning and the world of work. We'll end the session with actionable steps that you can take to be part of the collaborations and courageous process with Global Minded and the World Academy of Art and Science Inclusive Leaders. I will just go right ahead into our introductions and want to um, start with Dr. Swayze and then we'll go, we'll go around the room. If you can just share a brief introduction about your work, why you're passionate about equity, we'll go Susan, Tim, Jeffrey, Isabel. Thank you, Carol, for inviting me today. And thank you, for Celeste, for facilitating my presence. Um, I'm, I'm so honored to be on this panel today. Um, there are so many good things happening right now in the, in the world of education. I know there's a lot of bad news, but there's some good news in our world. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to talk about it today. Uh, just quickly, so I have a doctorate and an MBA, and none of that is by chance. It was all by mentoring. Um, just a little kid from California and folks thought they saw something interesting in me and, and good in me and thought that they could help me um, do great things. And so I was adopted pretty much by my mentor um, and, and, and propelled forward and did some fantastic things. And there's so many more fun things to, to occur. Just quickly, I'm a professor. I teach statistics and research methods. I also founded a company called Diversity Think Tank where I'm helping other organizations of smaller size, small to medium size organizations realize their audacious goals in terms of equity, diversity, and inclusion. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. And now, uh, Tim. Hello, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. It's always nice to actually join uh, a panel with uh, Global Minded, Carol Carter and her uh, unique collection uh, of individuals. I represent Lockheed Martin. Lockheed Martin is a story company, of course, in aerospace and defense. And uh, it really does actually um, exist in a interesting nexus because it is so dependent on skills and talent that have to constantly evolve and keep up with what's actually happening in uh, both the trade space as well as any number of things that are cutting edge. Um, it also therefore, I, I will say, is also having to be a trendsetter relative to matching the society that we're in. Um, I think in the 1950s, your uh, prototypical engineer might be a white male, et cetera. Now the diversity is so important to us. Uh, we really do have to embrace a much larger context 
uh, the people that make up our organization because our customers reflect that. Um, at the core, I would say to you that um, when I think about this, when I talk to Carol and the rest of my colleagues on Global Minded, um, it really brings me back to a concept. And at Lockheed Martin, for Lockheed Martin Space, I run the business development organization. Um, one of the things I've done here is really preach about having a customer-centric approach. Sometimes people look at you and they say, of course, it's a customer-centric approach. I say, yeah, but like Copernicus, at a certain point, you know, you go into describing to a company, you need to put the customer in the center, not the company at the center. And that's sometimes behavior and cultural shift. Um, in this case, I would actually put it to you that both the students as well as companies are the customer at the center because this is where they meet. And I think that's part of the discussion we're having here today. So in specific, and I hope I have enough time, Carol, you'll, you'll go ahead and give me the gong. Um, there are like four main uh, areas that I preach inside my own company relative to having a customer centric mindset. And if we keep in mind, in this case, customers are the student and the company, it's really starting out with a compelling vision that's linked to uh, a promise, a brand promise as a, of a company. And in this case, a promise to uh, prospective students who could become employees and leaders of tomorrow, as well as a promise to the company um, it's really important that we go ahead and uh, say that these are the people who are going to be the future of your enterprise. I will tell you for myself, of course, I, I would appear to be the prototypical white male, uh, no doubt privileged. Uh, I grew up in some place that was absolutely outside the context of expectation of where we are, I am today. I grew up actually as an undocumented alien. Just so happens it was on the other side of the border that most people are familiar with. And in that regard, it was not my destiny to become uh, an executive and a leader in a company like Lockheed. So it's very important for me to actually stress that the relative uh, importance of where you come from, not just what you look like, has everything to do with diversity. And that as we get diverse candidates, uh, be they people of uh, color, uh, different religions and backgrounds, uh, certainly, and I would stress socioeconomic, uh, backgrounds. What you get is sometimes an imposter syndrome that comes upon you. And I speak from my personal experience. And so in this moment, right, when we stand or we talk about uh, a company communicating to people that are, come from a diverse background, how they actually make sense in the context of a very much an establishment firm, it's very important that we focus on the customer uh, to actually explain to them that there are many people surrounding them, even those that may not look at in first appearance to actually have traveled a path that they might be familiar with. Um, the second portion is it's always really about defining a must win battle defined from outside for these core constituents. And I mean that by saying, uh, which handful of actions will generate the most impact with our target customer, both the students and the companies. And this is really about the internship and apprenticeships that grow the diversity pipeline. I think that's a critical factor here. Moving right along, um, I would say there's, we, we use a, a term called the net promoter system for continuous improvement in the interaction with our customer sets. And that's really a question about how we can use customer feedback to promote uh, everyone's learning and behavior changes. In this case, mentorships, again, that matter. It's harnessing business know-how it's actually harnessing the diversity of perspectives. And I don't care if that's someone from a deep inner city Baltimore or someone from Appalachia that didn't have the advantages. It's very important that we bring that into the core of our actually our operating system, our firms. Um, and the last is something I would say a customer experience redesign. Again, keeping in mind that we have these two different stakeholder communities that we're really speaking to here today. It's about what we put ourselves in um, the customer's shoes what aspects of the experience needs to change. And thinking from the student's perspective, this is the diversity role model. From around the world, diversity helps us both um, with the customers here as well as the students. Where do we actually come together? And these children, I won't say children, forgive me. These young adults, in fact, are role models for many of us as we consider what our company and what our actual industry and our customer sets are gonna look like tomorrow. 
Thank you. And and Tim, just very quickly, and everyone's being flexible with us because Tim got a last minute um, notification. He had to see one of his presidents at Lockheed Martin this morning. So we're kind of moving some things around. Um, Tim, uh, before you have to jump off, can you just share a little bit? You've gone to some of the best institutions in the world, but please just share because these are 700 of the world's leading scientists that are part of World Academy of Art and Science. Just share a little bit about how you came from, you know, background of a single mom and par- poverty affected um, rearing and uh, how you got into um, those places of incredible education, which launched you as a person who's lived all over the world in Riyadh and Hong Kong and Kuala Lumpur and all the places that you've lived and worked. Sure. So, uh, yes, this is true. Um, my, my mother uh, in the uh, early 70s, in the advent of a divorce and a very strong uh, mother-in-law, as it were, decided to go ahead and jump across the border to uh, avoid a custody fight. Um, in that context, really cut ties with most of the things that we just assume are the surrounding sort of support network. Um, came back to the States several years later, but really grew up on a dusty truck stop in Southern Arizona. Uh, in that context, um, I think it's very important here to talk about role models. And in this case, I had a grandmother that was a role model. Uh, she herself grew up um, on a dirt farm in Georgia during the Depression. Uh, she herself then also figured out how to get an education. In her case, it was going to Boston to become a nurse. And she instilled in me the importance of education and how coming from a background that was disadvantaged, you could always find a way. And she really set me on a course to have expectations. I think that's the critical thing about mentorship is that we often um, conform to the expectations others have of us. I think that's just a truism. All you need is a few people to say, I see you. I see you in the unique instance that you're in. I see you for the strengths as well as the challenges that you have. And I'm telling you, I see a path for you. Why don't you go ahead and imagine your path? And in this case, to the point Carol was making, um, by the time I got through high school, um, I had decided I want to go into pre-med. And so I had volunteered all my weekends, the last two years of high school, to be in the emergency room in Tucson, Arizona, uh, essentially being... Uh, just hands-on, I suppose candy striper is what they call it today, uh, just to get some hands-on experience. And that's how I got into UC Davis uh, as a scholarship through the U.S. Army, uh, working as a pre-med student. As it happened prior to uh, in late 80s, it just turned out that um, we were having the end of the Cold War, and the focus really was on a peace dividend. So my scholarship went away. And what I found was, and it was one of the most important moments of my life, it felt like the plan had fallen apart and that that was a real place of uh, despair. But it was also a signal to me that the world is what you make it. And as it turned out, I figured out how to get a scholarship to Oxford. And at that moment, um, I agreed with them because I I said, I'd love to study law or something practical, right? You grow up disadvantaged, you're always thinking about something practical. And they said, well, we got a place for you to study history if you'll take it. And I said, good, history, I love it, I'm in. Um, And that really set me on a course around the world. I didn't really come back to the United States for 22 years. Um, And it allowed me to see much of the world, but it also allowed me to experience what it was like to be an outsider, uh, something of a ghost. People can interact with you when you're living in all of these different countries, uh, but you're not there in the context they perceive in terms of what they project for the future. And that's really a moment in which two things happen. One, you become very skilled at listening to people's meta what they really mean, what really drives them, what's really important. And because you come from someplace that's an outsider context, that's my story. I grew up in a place I was definitely an outsider, but in in Northern Mexico in that period of time was a very loving and careful uh, place. The children of all the types would always be taken care of. And so I had an outsider's perspective. Now I'm living around the world from Oxford, England to uh, Hong Kong, uh, Malaysia, uh, looking also living in Latin America, it was actually a benefit to me to be an outsider from the very beginning because it made me empathetic. And I really did start to understand these things. And eventually uh, that path led me to another degree at MIT, at Sloan. Um, and it was fascinating to me to be amidst what I would consider you know, my culture, my team. And yet I felt in reflection, at times I was more of an outsider in that room that I was actually in all the other places I traveled. So from me to the rest of the organization here, 
I would say that we need to be careful about our labels. Diversity is very important. And one of the things that I actually bring to Lockheed Martin as I uh, focus on business development, I really think about it as an outsider. I'm not an engineer. As I said, I finished my degree uh, in history, but it allows me to translate what's happening amongst the customer community with the people that are on the inside. So to that extent, I do represent the uh, promise of diversity and an outsider perspective. It's not the label or the, the visage that you would expect, but this is why I think it's so important that we have strong mentorships with folks that are coming in who don't feel like necessarily they fit the mold and actually share yourself with them at great liberty and just really put it out there to tell them they're not alone, particularly if they ever feel like they are, as I said, that imposter syndrome and feeling like they're an outsider who somehow snuck it. Thank you so much, Tim. And we'll go back to doing everybody's introductions and then we're gonna get into the different points, but we, we wanted to accommodate that we wanted Tim to be here with us today and also that he's able to, to get to his meeting. So thanks to all of you for, uh, for accommodating that. And then, um, and we're just doing introductions quickly and then we'll, um, we'll, we'll get into the, to the meat of the program. So yeah, do you Carol, wanna just go ahead yeah. and say hello? Oh, nice, nice to see you. I apologize myself with everybody. I was a little late with another session. No and, worries. Uh, but uh, I am honored to, uh, to, uh, to having me as a, as a you are co-moderator co for, this, for this session. And so uh, I think that uh, the point that we are, uh, are facing is quite interesting because uh, it's so important in the sense that uh, for me, the most crucial use of knowledge and education is to understand the importance of developing a good art, going to the core of an inner education. And that's, uh, and that, and that's the, the point that uh, you have to understand uh, immediately to talk about equity. You know, yeah, for you, sure. You have to, you know, have to know the, you have to, to be aware of the axis of heart yep. and mind. Yep. That is, for sure. Yeah. Well, we're yeah. delighted to do this with you today, and we hope to see you live in June, uh, Rodolfo, in Denver. So we'll plan on that, and let's go to Jeffrey for the next introduction, and then Isabel, and then we'll get into more of our content of the program. Thank you. I just got to say, I love listening to Tim. Every time I get a chance to hear his background, it's just a reminder uh, how, how lucky we all are to have someone who's in such an incredible position and yet still has the heart and the soul and the connected tissue to say, hey, I want to rise, raise the bar, if, I, if you will, of equity for everyone. So I appreciate hearing his thoughts. Uh, similar to Tim, not only did we dress alike today, uh, kind of we think alike a little bit as well. Um, I, I grew up as uh, a uh, single mom uh, in California. Uh, we were, uh, you know, part of the um, uh, the welfare system at the time. Uh, but we were rich in spirit, maybe not rich in the pocket. And uh, she 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 really pushed for opportunity for all of us. Long and short of it is, I had a chance to um, attend the uh, University of Maryland College Park on a scholarship and finish with a degree in economics and. Uh, as most folks who do in that area, you jump into finance and you get into money and banking. And I had this thing called a pivot moment. I think most of us have had some of those uh, where I had a tragedy in my family. My grandparents who had been married for 65 years died in a house fire. And they died primarily because um, Puerto Rican folks living in an underserved community, they bordered two counties that traded off on who would respond to fires and crime in this community. And as uh, fate would have it on the night they died, the, um, the EMS uh, system, the fire and rescue took 22 minutes to get to their house and they passed away. My, my grandmother had always said in, in, her, um, in her struggle to speak English that she wanted me to work with people and to help people. And so uh, after their death, um, I got involved with the government and much like Tim, I, you, know, you find yourself in places that you did not anticipate you would be. Uh, and I started working in the Department of Energy on workforce creation and workforce development issues. Uh, I continued down that path uh, for a number of years. And um, 
because, and I think as uh, Dr. Swayze mentioned, you've got mentors that believe in you. I had a few. I had the opportunity to jump into the nation's nuclear weapons program, uh, and I became the chief learning officer. So I was responsible for uh, developing leaders in the nation's nuclear weapons program and did that for a number of years. No kaboom uh, there. So I decided to move over to financial management uh, right after the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform Act passed, where our country was in a little bit of financial challenge. And I became the chief learning officer for the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. So now I'm responsible for leadership and learning development, executive development for those folks who are overseeing $600 trillion uh, swaps, options, and futures financial marketplace. And there were many days where I thought, my goodness, how does this, you know, kid who grew up uh, poor in California as well, how, how do you get this opportunity uh, to lead? But, but that mentorship paid off. And, and during this, I developed an expertise for about 10 or 12 years in generations. Uh, and I became uh, the federal government's expert on how to lead and manage across generations. And so I started a company called Generationology and really to help organizations to build an intergenerational culture an intergenerational workplace, and in really embrace an intergenerational workforce. And so along the way, I met this awesome, fantastic, inspirational person named Carol Carter. And uh, uh, I would think after maybe two conversations, she said, hey, we'd love you to join our board and help lead a couple of efforts. And um, I'm humbled to have spent that opportunity uh, leading and working um, beside her. I, I echo the sentiments of Dr. Swayze and Tim on the importance of mentorship. And as we get into the dialogue, we'll talk about it further. Gracias for the opportunity to be a part of this distinguished panel. De nada. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jeffrey. And Isabel, I have to say, she is not only uh, born in France, but right now she's coming to us from Qatar. So she's just landed and she's not jet lagged or anything. She's there for the WISE conference. Isabel, tell us a little bit about you, your story, your passion for this work, and then we'll get into our, our program. Yeah, I was already uh, high on energy before the discussion, but wow, hearing Dr. Sweezy, team and Jeffrey and um, Rodolfo's comments, I'm even more energized. So thank you. Uh, what inspiring um, uh, co-panelists. Uh, Carol, thank you so much for uh, assembling us uh, and for all the amazing work that you do. Um, my name is Isabel Howe, and I have um, been working at the intersection of education, philanthropy, and impact investing now for two decades. Uh, I was most recently a partner at Imaginable Futures, a venture of the Omidia Group. Uh, the philanthropy of eBay founder Pierre Omidyar and his wife Pam. Um, about my personal story, I, I was reading uh, a few months ago the biography of uh, Michelle Obama, and in the last chapter of the book, Becoming, she has this amazing quote that really deeply resonated with me. She said, I'm an ordinary person, on an extraordinary journey. And I feel like this is me. I'm an ordinary girl, you know, from uh, Southern France, uh, born in a rural village. And here I am on, you know, on these international scenes, traveling to Qatar, <laughs> uh, leading philanthropy, uh, you know, just it's, it's really, really extraordinary, um, extraordinary journey, certainly not, not, not on the same level as Michelle Obama, but uh, still for, for, for me personally, reflecting on how could we have these extraordinary opportunities that I had available to many, many more people. Um, and this is really what has driven most of my work uh, to date, um, um, this, this notion of um, um, uh, how to give access and more distributed access to uh, talent, uh, which is equally distributed, equ equally distributed, like I was in this rural village in southern France, more equitable. Uh, my strong belief, as you know, Carol, is that it has to start from the early years, which is where I have spent most of my professional life and my passion uh, trying to make an indent at um, uh, access to quality opportunities in the early years. But I've also done a lot of work um, 
with adult learners, uh, parents of those little ones, uh, and Jeffrey, a lot of things that are connected to your intergenerational uh, work, obviously. And Isabel was also one of the winners of our Inclusive Leader Awards for 2021. So that was also fabulous. All right, well, now we're gonna get into the kind of the meat of our program and we're gonna kick it off with Dr. Swayze to look at what needs to be different, Dr. Swayze in academia for us to be able to move these major levers of access and equity. We know that, that a lot of institutions of higher learning are hierarchical, patriarchal places of privilege. And so would love your insights for our listeners on that. Great, well, I've come to this from a variety of perspectives. So the first one is that I'm a first gen student. My parents uh, were not able to um, earn college degrees, but were sure that I was going to. And everything that I mentioned that I wanted to be when I grew up required a doctorate. If I wanted to be a fireman, my mom would say that requires a doctorate in fire science. If I wanted to, to, to <laughs> if I, I wanted to design a car that requires a doctorate in design of cars. Like it was always a doctorate. So I was always in my mind. So people would say to me, what do you want to be outside the house? My answer would be a college student because my mother said so. And my father's response was always what she said, do what she says. So that was always a mantra in our house. And so as I, you know, went about um, doing all the things you do to go to college, um, I realized, you know, even in my little, my little California, so I'm from Santa Rosa, California, in my little existence, that there's a big gap between hopes and dreams and how and now. And that is really the role um, that, that the mentors have played for me, those who have, uh, you know, identified um, areas in which they could give me, give me knowledge and then also provide opportunities. Um, and so when I look at the educational landscape of which that I'm a part currently as a professor and I look at my children's education, I see some good things that are happening, some very beneficial things. Um, coming out of COVID, many colleges have gone test optional, which has really been a benefit to um, under-resourced um, and, and kids of color who cannot get access to those testing companies and the, the assistance that gives you the, those higher test scores. And, Across the board, universities are reporting higher applications because of the test optional. So I think that is one of those positive outcomes that we are seeing and hopefully will continue is that that bar that we know um, favors um, kids of, of, of higher economic status and kids from better schools, um, that is now an optional um, application um, opportunity for students. And the other students are evaluated on things that actually bring more things to the fore, such as their essays, their life stories and things of those nature. So that's a positive. Another thing that schools are doing that I'm seeing more of that is a good and I hope that stays is that we are looking and are actually required to not only provide students the books that we are requiring months before the semester begins, but also, so that way students can find cheaper books, uh, maybe a free book, but also that we're required to find more online resources, things that are actually you know, free open source textbooks so that there is a zero cost for the textbook um, piece of the course. So there are, are, are trends that are occurring. In terms of the classroom itself, um, many professors and universities are moving toward um, building in diversity, equity, inclusion into the classroom. I've done research on that myself, um, ways in which to build a safe classroom for students so that we are able to discuss issues of race, gender, um, sexuality, um, and, and, in, and even immigration, because in the United States that is so important, as well as disability status, have those conversations in the classroom and to build a, a structure by which we can do that, to set the groundwork from the very beginning in the syllabus. Because if we are interested in changing these things, we all need to be conversant in them. So part of that is building that language. So there are moves happening in universities that will benefit students across the board. Um, and and as, we, as we continue on, um, for in, instead of the, the one-to-one -one mentorship model, we're actually restructuring um, the system itself um, from the inside and from the outside. So just so you know, I've served on a hundred dis doctoral dissertations so far. And my, one of my favorite stories is this one. I'm working on diversifying the doctorate one student at a time as a, as a faculty member. One of my favorite stories I wanna leave you with is um, my student I, who will remain nameless, but I will say she 
defended her doctorate. She studied ageism in the federal workforce. Awesome, awesome study. And she's doing a lot of work internationally based on it. She was rushing to get her edits done. Those of you who have done a, a, a dissertation or a thesis, you know you have to do edits after your defense. She's rushing to get a dissertation done to get the edits in. And she said, I have I only have 15 days. I said, no, you actually have 30. She said, no, I have 15, I have 15. And I said, okay, let me help you. Come over the weekend, we'll work on this over the weekend. You know, you know, tick, 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 tick on the keyboard. Come to find out she was to turn 65 on the 16th day. And she had promised herself that she would earn her doctorate before she turned 65. And we were part of that, you know, and we didn't know that was her goal, but that was why she was trying to get it done in 15 days, not that 16th day. Um, but there are so many good stories out there. And the more that we can share them and, and applaud and mentor and sponsor and, and, and join Carol in the great work that she's doing, so we'll have so many more good stories to share. Thank you so much, Susan. Jeffrey, tell us a little bit about um, looking across generations, what impact um, people who are, are our age and older can have on the emerging you know, talent base of leaders and also how we can understand Gen Z, empower them and really co-create a very meaningful learning environment and work environment with them around the things that they really value. You know, Carol, thanks so much for the opportunity to, to talk on this issue. I'm trying to hold myself back because, you know, I'm super excited most of the time, so I'm trying to maintain myself. But when Dr. Swayze is talking about ageism in the federal government, I'm like, oh, I need a copy of that doctoral dissertation, ma'am, at some point. And I know uh, Isabel's desire and help and focus on particularly the young and the parents. So I feel like we're all uh, talking from the same soil, if you will, even though we might be growing uh, different trees. Um, I'd start out by actually issuing a little bit of a challenge to all of us. Anyone who is um, over the age of 40, which you know millennials are uh, 23 to 40, Gen Z is under the age of 23, but anyone who's over the age of 40, I I'd like to issue a challenge because if change is going to start. It's got to be with a collaborative mindset. So really, Carol, I think there's three things we need to focus on. Um, all of us, we have to set and sustain a baseline of our generational knowledge. It amazes me how many corporations, clients that I have who will say, Jeff, we really need help. And I'm like, great, let's talk about it. We need help on onboarding. We need help on developing our workforce. We need help on, on leadership development. And great. And we start having this conversation. And one of the first things I ask them is, you know, how are you intentionally building an intergenerational team? Because every time I come in to talk to you, everybody's from the same generation. And here's a, you know, uh, a, a moment of, of pause. If you invite the same generation to this table and you ask them to come up with a solution for another generation, by and large, you're going to create what's called a gap. You're going to have everyone around the table super excited about their idea, realizing that their idea doesn't have any actual legs to implementation. So you start to have this conversation by first setting a baseline. Who are the people who are working alongside, partnering with? Who, who are they? And I think Dr. Swayze said it well. Everybody has a, a story. Do you, know your, do, do you know their story? Do you know their story enough that you could tell it for them? One of the challenges with, with Gen Z is we have given them the opportunity to be storytellers in micro bites, two minutes. But what if you told a story for 20 minutes? What does that look like? Ah, well, the other generations, baby boomers and beyond, want a little bit more than the two minutes. How do we create a baseline of knowledge? How do we, how do we challenge ourselves to really know a generation. Cause you gotta, before you can lead a generation, you have to know a generation and you have to love a generation and you gotta be able to learn from that generation. So I'd say argument one is we have to set and sustain a, a baseline of our generational knowledge. The second is all of us have to increase, it's a phrase we use, our intergenerational collaborative intelligence. It's not just that you get people to a table, you got to figure out how is it that they best like to collaborate around that table? What's their learning styles, their thinking styles, and what's their leadership styles? 15 seconds on that. 
we, we all know because we work with young people every day that their preferred methodology is texting, even if you're two meters away from someone else, right? You could wave, but why don't we test, text? It's more efficient and I can multitask. Well, what we try to do is to help young people when they're entering the workforce to recognize that a baby boomer wants you to look at them in the eye. They want to see all of the nuances that aren't identified on, in the text. They want to get an idea of who you are by how you show up. And Gen Z says, well, I showed up with 18 characters. I'm good. And I, I threw you five emojis. You should know how I feel. But we can understand there's gaps that are there. So if we expect to collaborate, we have to increase our collaborative intelligence. Think about this. What does an awards and recognition program look like? When I'm world and they'll say, Jeff, we need, an award, we need a rewards program, but their award program looks like the three Ps, picture, plaque, and pose, and you get a little signed picture and put up in your office. That worked for a baby boomer. It does not work for Gen Z. They want what we're doing today. So I applaud the incredible work the World Academy of Arts and Sciences are doing because they're, they're, they're streaming this live on YouTube. That's what they want to see. They want to be able to go back to it. And finally, Carol, I say that all of us, we have to intentionally seek and maintain an intergenerational leadership culture. Thomasina Matthews, may she rest in peace when I was working on workforce development issues. African-American woman that I worked for for 10 years was simply brilliant. Let me say, say that again. She was simply brilliant. And she taught all of us. We worked learning from her how to create great workforce actions, workforce development programs. She was significantly older. And without question, she gave me leadership opportunities I probably should not have had. I didn't, I hadn't earned the pedigree to have it, but she felt she saw something in me that launched me to do that. Not surprising enough, what she built in with me and the team we had was an intergenerational cultural appreciation for one another. We worked for her and were led by her. Fast forward 15 years, I have the opportunity to lead you know, the, the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. We're overseeing the futures options, swaps financial marketplace. And it turns out that, and I'll tell the story often, Carol, but it turns out that uh, my team of 12 were uh, 10 African-American women. I learned and worked alongside them. It was interesting. We would come into a room with uh, financial executives from Wall Street, and they were often looking for the you know, leaders. And sometimes I'd be at the table early and somebody would lean over and say, hey, um, you know, when Jeff's showing up and I'd smile because Jeff's already at the table. Right. But the idea is we need to create intergenerational leadership opportunities through a cultural experience where we recognize that we're bigger, better and stronger together when we focus on what we can be versus on where we are today. Thanks. Awesome, thank you, Jeff. And I will say that Global Minded has at least five, if not 10 amazing people over 80 who come every year to our conference. And one of them, Ben Akalik, she writes a book a year. And I just think they're redefining what it looks like to be in your 80s. So those are the wisdom keepers and all the other younger people need to be with us co-creating what, what's happening. So Isabel, one of the things we know is that if, if the money doesn't start to move differently, if people don't start to really be able to fund and resource some of these big initiatives, then we can't have that impact at scale. So share with us from your world of what um, you see the issues and the opportunities where we really can achieve um, this major global impact financially as well. Yeah, thank you. Um, so the money flows away now, and uh, I was trying to think about your question, Carol, at, uh, at multiple levels. They, are, they have one common characteristic, which is that they are all inequitable currently. Uh, so if we take venture capital, for instance, um, you know, less than 1% of entrepreneurs are funded, but are funded by venture capital are black entrepreneurs. And I recall funding a few years ago, a woman who CEO who was a Latina, and there was not even a category for her for the company that she was leading, given how few women of color are founders and receive funding from venture capital. Uh, 
And clearly, if you go back to the monophores, it this traces back to the fact that uh, about 1% of the 70 trillion wealth management industry is controlled by women or minority fund managers. But even if we take philanthropy, the world that I come from, um, a year ago or so, um, this great nonprofit Echoing Green uh, partnered with Bridgespan and they did an analysis of money flows in, uh, in philanthropy. And they showed that only 11% of the big bets, you know, those large multi million grants that are being awarded to big projects were led by people of color, 11%. So well below what the demographics would suggest and also well below what I think philanthropy is not intending to do. Um, so organizations that are led by people of color are not only less funded in general, but when they are, the amounts that go to them are much lower in a dollar in quantity of, um, of amounts um, that are being disbursed. And in higher education, uh, we also have uh, inequities. Um, one stat that I heard recently from, uh, from John King, uh, the former uh, Secretary of Education, is that financial aid, uh, so in the form of Pell Grants in the US, have decreased from 80% of the cost of a four-year college degree in the 1980s to today about 28%. So meaningful drop in public government funding to those who need it the most, leaving obviously um, students to self-fund um, uh, their, their college education. So what do we need to do, uh, which I think was part of the, the discussion and I'm hoping to get some, of, some, some insights from some of the other panelists as well. But as I was reflecting on, on it, I think we need at least four different things and probably more. Um, uh, one is that we need philanthropy and impact investing to make bets with a focus on equity. Um, so funding organizations that are truly closing the achievement or outcome gaps. Um, we also need this funding to be more and more unconditional. We need to trust those leaders who lead those organizations. Um, two, we need innovations from the private sector. Um, uh, and the private sector is uh, the nonprofit and maybe some for-profit organizations. So, you know, organizations like Global Minded uh, that are focused on social capital for first generation students are such exemplary of, uh, of impact that we need in this world. Um, another organization that I wanted to highlight that I had funded a few years ago is Equity, that helps colleges fund emergency financial aid for, uh, for students and often students drop out of college for $400 bills. So uh, this emergency aid really um, is catalytic in, uh, in, um, in uh, completion of a degree. And we also need um, you know, more partnerships between employers, governments, a private sector, and of course, academic institutions. Um, you know, someone mentioned apprenticeships early on in our conversation. Uh, I think those are great examples of, uh, of innovations where we need all the parties at the table to make an apprenticeship work. Uh, we need colleges, we need uh, tax incentives from the government, we need employers, of course, to uh, host those apprentices. Uh, those, those apprentices. Um, so we need, we need some more of those um, uh, public to private partnerships um, um, promoting equity. Uh, another example of this is, um, which I'm, I'm, I'm following carefully and I really, really uh, um, admire, uh, is this trend toward education as a benefit that um, was started by a um, uh, business called uh, Guild Education in Colorado that has now very large employers such as Walmart, Chipotle, and many others 
um, waste management as well. Um, and uh, uh, effectively, employers pay for the tuition for their employers to go back to college for free or heavily subsidized rate. Um, and in the case of waste management, what is really, really fascinating is that uh, they not only pay for their employees, they pay for family members of the employees. So truly a multi-generational impact potentially from this initiative uh, from certain, certain really employers. And then last, um, we, last, last thing that I wanted to maybe think about together is uh, ideally so more innovations in the forms of financing. Um, so much of the financing has been focused on the history of a student. And I would love for financing to go more toward the potential of students. Um, the problem with history of students uh, is that if you need a cosigner as a family, that doesn't work. Uh, if your family doesn't have the means or is not able to be a cosigner. Um, so how can we think more about the potential uh, of students in higher education? And Isabel, thank you so much for that point, because really in the past, when you were born and where you were born has had the most impact on where you went to school. And I think all of the different um, people sharing their perspectives today all you know, beat the odds to be able to ascend within the highest education, um, educational institutions. And, um, and, and that can be so much more the norm than the exception, which it has been the last few decades. So thank you so much for those insights, Isabel. And um, Rudolfo, is there anything else that you'd like to add on before we ask people for questions that they might have? Um, I'd like to add a, a little uh, component that uh, may be uh, uh, from a practical point of view, a way to proceed with uh, uh, the World Academy and Global Minded that uh, I think uh, we need to develop in a, in an educational ecosystem uh, able to capture uh, a, a, the social combination and communication by uh, regenerative co-evolving learning. And um, in, in the sense that they, in, in that way, that we will start understanding the value uh, the, in a better way of our biodiversity in the universe, which we are immersed within and we are part of it. And so the World Academy and Global Minded can set a new inclusive standard international collective, collaborative, competitive, uh, uh, approach by mobi mobilizing uncommon collaborative competitive uh, co competitors to move uh, the global levels of access and equity to achieve uh, lasting imp impact at scale. Awesome. And thank you so much. And maybe um, for those who are listening, uh, we can invite people to put some questions in and I'll just kind of share a little summary while people might be thinking about questions. And then maybe even if there's other um, insights that the panelists want to share, um, we can go to those as well. So um, I, I just want to, before we close out, just thank you, Rodolfo and Susan and Jeffrey, Tim and Isabel, uh, just for their time today and for supporting Global Minded. And um, individually and as a community, we wanna really look at what are the things we can do to move from discussing these issues to truly solving for these issues. So we wanna get more women, people of color, poverty affected citizens into the education, ec economic mobility and leadership pipeline. And many of these are our least resourced students. Yeah. So what, can we do? One of the first things is to show up and stand up for first generation and poverty affected students and professionals. See them, encourage them and support them. One example at Global Minded is that 
we really believe in the power of community across different generations. So in 2017, we created our alumni network of first generation professionals. So this community hosts events, webinars and seminars to empower and support global minded students and young alumni as they experience their leadership journey. So consider participating in one of our alumni events or having your organization be uh, an alumni partner or sponsor with us. Two, share your own talents and experiences. At Global Minded, we've partnered with colleges of many different types who serve a lot of poverty affected and low income students. And we support them through a series of professional mentors and they break down the hidden curriculum for success and really prepare these students to have the perspective that um, really Tim and Susan and Jeffrey um, and Isabel described of how to understand what those networks are to really be able to do better. So consider becoming yourself one of those professional mentors. Three, join us. Your unique personal and professional experiences can help shape the lives of others. Your insights and your vision can inspire a whole new generation as well as those who are your colleagues right now. So we invite you to join us in June, June 22nd, 23rd, and 24th for the Global Minded Conference in Denver, where you can expand and share your knowledge. And partners like WAS, the Consul General of Canada, the International Labor Organization, the UN Office of Strategic Partnerships, and others are speakers. And uh, we invite you to speak speak or participate. And all of that is open right now on our website. Um, the people that you've experienced for this last 45 minutes, imagine um, 1,500 to 2,000 people who are like these people. And that's what's so uh, life-changing, I think, for the students who, who join and participate. Four, promote an intergenerational leadership culture. Focus on collaboration. Co-create the future of learning with students, not just the experts. This will create graduates who can rise to positions of responsibility with a firm grasp of their practical and professional skills, as well as the academic knowledge that they need. Finally, act with urgency. Students and young professionals need you in the game right now. The world can't wait for these things to be solved. They can't afford another day without your corporate and personal level of involvement. So act with urgency and let's work together to achieve these things so we really can change the world and create a very sustainable future for the next group of generations who haven't even been born yet. Susan and Jeffrey and Isabel, and then I'll hand it to you, Rodolfo. Okay. I am so inspired by my students. One of my students, the one most recent one that defended who did her study on is actually gendered ageism in the federal workforce. Um, her her, her, um, when, she pres when she presents now, her tagline is to the younger women who are in the audience is create the workforce you want to age into. I love it too. And so I'm, I'm trying to think of a way to make that my tagline. I'm not sure what the words are, but I wanna build on that. So create the workforce that you want to age into or create the workforce that you want your children to inherit, right? So. So there, there's gotta be something to that. And I would love to continue the conversation, but I wanna end it there. How about that? Create the workforce. I love you it. And put that in the chat as well. Okay, Jeffrey. I could listen to Dr. Sweezy all day. I'm, I'm up to sign up uh, to get some more wisdom from her. Uh, I, I would say two things come to mind. One, do not let your comfort zone keep you away from your courage zone. I mean, you have got to reach out. There's so many young people who are brilliant and they don't know it because they have to manage a life that includes taking care of their parents, working part-time, having little time to study. They don't understand the importance of building social capital. And the list could go on. I'm sure Isabel could add a hundred things to it. And yet we have an expectation that they perform the same as a majority student who's provided with every opportunity to learn and grow from a very young age. So we have to step forward for, for them with respect to moving away from our comfort zone 
pro the project projects activities and positions we've had and go in the courage zone sit with them where they are and bring them along authentically which means this sometimes you got to be you know you, you got to have a little tough love one of my favorite folks in the world is dr cornell west and he says you got to speak truth to power with love in order to effectuate change and you got to do that with young people too when they're doing a great job you got to tell them great job but when they're not, you got to tell them, hey, you could do better here. And here's the expectation I have. And here's how you get there. We got to give of ourselves. The last thing I'll say is a phrase that I believe in. You got to give before you get. You got to offer before you ask. So continue to be, as my mentor, Ken Blanchard says, be a servant leader and you will be in a better place. So it's great to serve today with you, Carol. You know, invite me wherever you're at, young lady. I'm, I'm, always, a, I'm always a willing participant to do what it is that you're doing. Thanks. Thank you, Jeffrey and Isabel. Go ahead. Yeah, when I was at uh, Imaginable Futures, I had um, the privilege of um, working with a group of uh, 24 uh, student parents. Um, you know, some had been uh, previously incarcerated, some were homeless. Um, they were all from different parts of the country. And one of them, um, told me this beautiful, um, inspiring um, quote that has remained with me. Um, she said, um, do not meet me where I am, meet me where I dream. Love that, put that in there too. And uh, I will just say before I pass it to Rodolfo that we have at Global Minded a bold goal that by 2025, we wanna connect 25 million first-gen students, first-gen graduates, those who work with them and those who wanna hire them My algorithmically goodness. to role models, mentors, internships, and jobs. So I'll put that in there as well and I'll put the dates for our conference and then I'll pass it over to Rodolfo to, to close us out, but so glad to be with all of you today and for all of you um, who made this a priority. Rodolfo. Thank you, Carol. Um, well, I think, uh, that we have to be aware that living systems uh, are, uh, well, living organisms <laughs> are a, a constant combining of multiple forms of communication and interactions uh, of world data. While it, while it may be possible to capture some of them by first order combining and, and, and communications, approximations in living systems, and transmit them to future generations by education. The second and higher orders of combination and communications remain unseen, inseparable, undefiable, and crucial to the trajectories, well being, and aesthetics of ongoing inclusive vitality. I think that uh, uh, the, uh, the World Academy and Global Minded need to, to develop an education uh, ecosystem able to capture the second in higher order orders of social combination and communications by a regenerative co-evolving world. And so uh, my two lines to transmit to future uh, meetings are, are Reimagining re re with us an inspirational framework embedded in, in coevolutionary living in the present, and that uh, current actions regenerate value into future, moving the levers uh, of um, uh, access from infancy to lifelong lifelong learning. Awesome. Well, thanks to everybody.